Tonight, Queensland's party leaders go head to head in the election eve debate. My team has a strong plan. It's the people's plan. When Mr Newman talks about the future, remember the past. Remember the arrogance. Remember the broken promises. Also ahead, at the end of a punishing week, Tony Abbott aims for the reset button by praising his team and its leader. Four billion dollars. The Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse estimates the cost of compensating victims. And coming up on the drum, the Australian newspaper under fire for calling author Colleen McCulloch plain and overweight in her obituary. You're watching ABC News. Good evening, I'm Rachel Papazzoni. Just three years ago, Queensland Premier Campbell Newman was swept to power in a stunning victory. Now he's fighting for his political career, facing the prospect of losing his own seat in tomorrow's election. The Liberal National Party is predicted to hold on to power but faces losing several seats. Donna Field reports. Former Brisbane Lord Mayor Campbell Newman took a big risk in 2012, vying to become Premier without a seat. It paid off. He was rewarded with the marginal Brisbane electorate of Ashgrove and the LNP an enormous victory. But his choice has come back to haunt him. My firm belief, and you're asking my belief, is that Ashgrove uh, will go with government. Uh, and I'm absolutely convinced of that. But the Premier's assertion is idealistic. A 5.7% swing will lose him Ashgrove, whereas a swing of more than 12% is needed for his government to lose. Former Labor Minister Kate Jones is his opponent in Ashgrove. From what I'm hearing, there is definitely a move for change. The Premier is staying on message and won't canvas a plan B. The LNP does have a plan. It's got a very strong team. It's got a plan that was created with Queenslanders. Our plans are fully costed and fully funded because we've got the guts to go and tell it like it is and lease some assets. At the leaders' debate, Labor's Anastasia Palaszczuk was frank about the mammoth task her party faces. This is a David and Goliath battle. We currently hold nine out of the 89 seats in the Queensland Parliament. The key campaign issue has been the future of public assets. The LNP wants to lease them, raising $37 billion to reduce debt and fund infrastructure. We will keep those assets. We will use the profits they make to pay down debt in a measured, responsible way and restore frontline service for services that have been savagely cut. And while Labor heavyweights hit the hustings, the Prime Minister stayed away. He's wanted to run his own race. Uh, that's his right, uh, because this is uh, about Queensland and about the Queensland Government. This election broke with tradition from the start. It's the first time one's been held in January in Australia in 100 years. And come Sunday, it may be an election that returns the Government, but not the Premier. Donna Field, ABC News, Brisbane. The ABC's election analyst Anthony Green says he expects the LNP to retain power but says there'll be a big swing to Queensland Labor. If Labor wins this election, it will be the most astonishing turnaround in Australian political history. The last election up here was the most one-sided election result we've ever seen in terms of seats. It was a most astonishing result. And if that is turned around in one term, it will be truly amazing. I, I can't see it being turned around in one term. There will clearly be a big swing to Labor. That's simply the, the laws of political gra gravity at play, that there has to be a swing back to Labor, given the lopsided nature from last time. It's a matter of how big that is. Um, and we'll see what happens. And, of course, there is that added complication of the Premier in his own seat. Well, Labor needs a swing of more than 12%. The swing in Ashgrove is 5.7%. So, in other words, even if the Labor Party gets only half of the swing it needs to get, to get into government, it can defeat the Premier. And that's the real difficulties in. And all the polls we've seen for most of the last year have had him behind. The most recent one had him behind 54-46. Uh, if that poll's anything like right, uh, anything like correct, then um, Campbell Newman would be defeated on, on Saturday night. If you look at the last 40 years of Australian politics and you track the change in governments federally, one of the first things that starts to happen after a change of federal government is the new governing party's state brethren start to lose elections and do badly at elections. Uh, when John Howard came to power, there were coalition governments nearly everywhere in Australia. By the time he left office, there were wall-to-wall -wall Labor governments. 
Um, and the same occurred after 2007 with the disappearance of Labor governments. And I'd imagine that um, we've seen a similar trend since the Abbott government came to office and I'd imagine that's going to continue. Tony Abbott has declared himself a very good captain of the government's team at the end of the most punishing week of his tenure as Prime Minister. He wants to move on from his widely ridiculed decision to knight Prince Philip, but if the Queensland election goes badly, he is likely to wear some of the blame. Political editor Chris Yulman. After a right royal nightmare of a week, the Prime Minister wants to hit the reset button. This is a happy day. Right, have a go. Tony Abbott sought to put the unhappiness behind him, stepping out to Victorian dairy exporter Buller to sell the benefits of the government's free trade agreements. With Korea, with Japan and with China, which are going to do very good things for businesses like this. But he's still dogged by his captain's call to knight Prince Philip, which he now admits wouldn't pass muster in the front bar. I'm sure if I uh, went into the pub uh, to talk about it, uh, they'd say it was a stuff up. I'd take that on the chin uh, and then we'd move on and discuss other subjects and that's exactly what I propose to do today. He was keen to take credit for the success of some of the government's strongest performers, including those who might be seen as potential leadership rivals, the Social Services Minister and the Foreign and Communications Ministers. They've got a very good captain. Uh, it takes a good captain uh, to help uh, all the players of a team to excel. It left a large opening for the opposition leader. Frankly, the captain of the Titanic would look good standing next to Tony Abbott. With the Prime Minister facing an internal revolt over his missteps, the Treasurer sent a message to the coalition troops, warning them not to repeat the mistakes of the past. We do not want to become a carbon copy of a bad Labor government. The next problem for the Prime Minister will come swiftly. Queensland goes to the polls tomorrow and the Liberal National Party is expected to lose dozens of seats, perhaps even a Premier. Through the eyes of now jaundiced coalition MPs, part of that will be Tony Abbott's fault. Chris Yulman, ABC News, Canberra. At least $4 billion will be needed to compensate survivors of institutionalised child sexual abuse. That's the estimate of the Royal Commission, which says the bulk of that money should come from the institutions responsible for the abuse. It's also suggesting victims get a direct apology and psychological care for life. Deborah Rice reports. The personal price paid by victims who lost their childhood to sexual predators can never be calculated, but a figure is finally being put on a payout to them. The total cost of redress nationally would be, would be in the order of $4.378 billion. It's a victory of sorts. We lost our childhoods and the nation needs to be accountable. The Royal Commission's model assumes there are around 65,000 survivors eligible for an average of $65,000 each, with maximum payments up to $200,000. The cost would be borne by the state institutions and the private organisations, charities and churches responsible for the abuse. And if they need to sell assets, then so be it. The state and federal governments would have to cover the gap where those entities no longer exist. Many survivors want one independent national scheme. When they've been abused in a state-based institution, it's very difficult for them to trust a state response. The Catholic Church says it's on board. The days of the Catholic Church investigating itself are over. The need for a national scheme is crucial. But the Royal Commission's figure is only an estimate and it's now calling for public input into the formula. As well as the money, it's suggesting a direct apology from the institutions at fault and psychological care for life. Also up for discussion is whether to reverse the onus of proof. So the institution has to prove it took reasonable care of the child instead of the survivor having to prove they were abused. By holding institutions financially responsible for exposing children to danger, they will finally stop that behaviour because nothing to date has made them stop. The Royal Commission plans to report on the issue by mid-year. Deborah Rice, ABC News. The turmoil at the top of the New South Wales Police Force was on show today during an inquiry into a secret surveillance operation. The hearing heard that Deputy Commissioner Nick Haldis was bugged by his team run by his fellow deputy, Catherine Byrne, and later overseen by the Commissioner Andrew Scipioni. Mr Caldas has accused the Internal Affairs Branch of breaking the law 
covering it up and jeopardising his faith in the entire justice system. Nick Dole reports. Nick Caldas has locked up thousands of criminals. He says few of them have been treated as poorly as he has. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened to me and my family 10 years ago was unfair and wrong, dead wrong. Mr Caldas was one of more than 100 officers who were targeted by police internal affairs between 1999 and 2001. He's told the inquiry his phone and office were bugged. Even the home his children lived in was spied on, he says, using dodgy warrants. What we have is evidence of improper and probably illegal behaviour. Judges being misled, a comprehensive cover-up or at least a blind eye being provided by those who are supposed to keep us honest. Nick Caldas complained about his alleged mistreatment and says he was punished for it. He's told the inquiry he was repeatedly overlooked for promotion and had a senior role in the counter-terrorism squad taken off him before he'd even started in the job. Mr Caldas had hoped the Ombudsman would get to the bottom of the matter, but claims he was instead attacked for blowing the whistle. I felt every aspect of my life was invaded. My phone calls, my work, my private life, despite no real accusation being levelled at me. The Deputy Commissioner says he believes the bugging was used to settle old scores. Mr Caldas told the inquiry he had a well-known conflict with senior members of the squad that was spying on him. One of those officers is now his fellow Deputy Commissioner Catherine Byrne, but she's denied there was any bad blood between them, at least back then. Today, she told the inquiry her reputation is being unfairly damaged. If it is suggested that there has been a cover-up of the activities of the Special Crime Unit in relation to the applications and warrants, I deny absolutely that I have done so. But she did admit warrants to bug officers were granted by courts without the evidence to back them up. That's disgraceful, isn't it? It's, it's serious. And yes. it's shocking, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's serious. The state's highest ranking officer is also set to be quizzed about his knowledge of the affair. Andrew Scipioni, a former head of internal affairs, will front the inquiry next week. Immigration detainees on Manus Island are being denied a taste of freedom after a large shipment of muesli bars was rejected by the detention centre. The snacks were turned away because their brand name, Freedom Foods, was deemed inappropriate. James Oten reports. What's in a name? Freedom Foods new snack bars are more nutritious, more delicious and not free. Apparently a lot when dealing with a group of asylum seekers detained indefinitely. The ABC has learned a shipment of Freedom Foods muesli bars was denied entry to the Manus Island Detention Centre around two weeks ago. The centre's operator, Transfield Services, referred the ABC to the Immigration Department, which responded in a statement saying, the sourcing of food provided to transferees is a matter for the service provider and for the Papua New Guinea authorities. Freedom Foods don't carry a political message, but rather a food standards message. They're free from allergens, such as nuts and gluten. So we're great believers in both making sure that food is safe and allergens... In and it's believed that, that food Secondly, will now be safely believers. handled by Australian defence personnel. While disappointed with the blockade, Freedom Foods says it's glad the food won't be detained and go to waste. James Oten, ABC News. A final attempt to save two Australian drug smugglers from an Indonesian firing squad is underway. Applications for judicial reviews for Andrew Chan and Muran Sukumaran are now in the hands of Denpasar District Court officials. Indonesia correspondent George Roberts reports. These were the pleas that the President ignored. The letters obtained by ABC News were handwritten by Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran asking for his forgiveness, for the trust they abused and for the pain they caused. Now today, a significant moment in their final bid for mercy. Denpasar District Court officials arrived at Korobakan Prison to accept applications for Chan and Sukumaran to get another hearing. The Chairman of the District Court will review and decide whether the judicial review will go ahead or not. He has the authority. Basically, judicial review requests have been lodged. Denied presidential pardons, the two convicted drug smugglers could be executed within weeks. But they, their families and their lawyers hope they'll be spared from the firing squad, at least until the court has considered their plea.
we have to respect the legal process. Yes. yes. Uh, so uh, there, there should not be execution because legal process has to be respected as well. The Denpasar District Court spokesman has told ABC News that lodging the application for a review is just an administrative step. Chan and Sukumaran's request will be considered by the court's chairman in consultation with the Supreme Court, which has already ruled that people shouldn't be granted a second chance at a judicial review. At a candlelight vigil in Sydney, hundreds gathered. Sukumaran's grandmother was among them. Please, President, please, don't kill him, please, don't kill him. It's unclear how long it will take for the Indonesian courts to make the final decision on the two men's fate, but at least for now, neither man has been scheduled to face the firing squad. George Roberts, ABC News, Bali. Chinese families have reacted angrily to Malaysia's official declaration that the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 was an accident. Malaysia says the search for the plane that went missing 10 months ago will continue, even though everyone on board the plane is presumed dead. The ABC's Hui Fen Tei met the distressed families in Beijing. It's been 10 months since Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 disappeared while flying from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Last night, Malaysia's Department of Civil Aviation released a pre-recorded video after cancelling a press conference because they said only the media were supposed to be present, not families. They declared the disappearance of MH370 an accident. All 239 of the passengers and crew on board MH370 are presumed to have lost their lives. Some of the families of the Chinese passengers on board believe their loved ones are still alive. This woman says, all of us only have one child. Our hopes are all on that plane. My son, daughter-in-law and grandchild were all on board. Family members have been suspicious about the way the plane vanished from the very beginning. They believe an official declaration of the plane's disappearance is irresponsible. This man says Malaysia has made this announcement without any evidence. It is cold, cruel, irresponsible and illegal. And even though this is a tragedy, Chinese police are sensitive about gatherings organized by the Family Support Network. They broke up the private event and questioned the media, including the ABC. Malaysia says the search for the plane will continue. They stress the investigation is still going on. Hui Fentei, ABC News, Beijing. Essendon coach James Hurt has failed in his bid to quash the long-running anti-doping investigation against his club. The federal court today dismissed Hurd's appeal, which challenged the legality of Asada's investigation into the Bombers' use of supplements. The coach has 28 days to decide whether to take his battle to the High Court. James Hurd was a notable absentee at the federal court, and it might have been just as well. His appeal against a federal court decision last September was emphatically dismissed. Is a high court challenge possible? Yes. Uh, have you had a chance to talk to your client? No. At the heart of the case is an investigation which has led to 34 past and present Essendon players facing doping allegations. Heard's lawyers argued the court's original judgment was flawed and claimed the anti-doping body acted unlawfully by cooperating with the AFL to coerce players into giving testimony. The court disagreed, with Justice Susan Kenny noting, the legislative scheme enabled ASADA to benefit lawfully from the AFL's use of its compulsory contractual powers. Justice Kenny also dismissed claims the players did not freely consent to be interviewed. No one objected to answering any questions, she said, whether on the grounds that his answer might incriminate him or expose him to civil penalty. The verdict comes as the AFL's anti-doping tribunal continues proceedings against the so-called Essendon 34. The tribunal will ultimately decide whether those players face suspensions, but a verdict isn't expected until sometime in March. So while one chapter has finished here today, we're still some way from a final resolution. Damien McIver, ABC News.
world number one Novak Djokovic is taking on defending Australian Open champion Stan Wawrinka in tonight's semi-final. Both players were on serve during the first set, pushing it to a tie-break. Djokovic claimed the set 7-6. Things went up a notch in the second, with Djokovic asserting his power. Wawrinka followed shortly after, showing he won't go down without a fight. He got in front 4-2 in the second before wrapping up the set 6-3. And women's finalist Serena Williams was forced to finish today's training session early due to sickness. The five-time Australian Open winner appeared an hour late to her scheduled training and her ankle was heavily bandaged. Once she took to the court, she only lasted a few minutes before taking a break. She gave it another go but again only lasted a few minutes before calling an end to training. Williams will play Maria Sharapova in the women's final on Saturday. The Socceroos are just one win away from lifting the Asian Cup trophy. Chen Browning was at their final training run at Sydney's Olympic Stadium before tomorrow's decider against South Korea. The Socceroos have put the finishing touches on their preparations for tomorrow night's Asian Cup final. It will be the team's chance to win its first major piece of footballing silverware. A victory will also help erase the memories of the Asian Cup loss to Japan four years ago. The Australians take on the informed South Korea who haven't lost a game or conceded a goal all tournament. The Koreans defeated the Socceroos 1-0 earlier this month, but several Australian players were rested that night. And Ange Postacoglu is confident of a different result this time round. I don't think it's going to have a great bearing on it. You know, I, I really believe that regardless of who you play in a final, previous form becomes a little bit irrelevant just because of the occasion of a big game. What would meaning mean to me? To everything. Winning would mean everything. Winning means to me everything all the time. Uh, it's going to be no different tomorrow. Socceroos defender Ivan Franic trained today in a bid to prove his fitness for the decider. A sellout crowd of more than 80,000 fans will pack into the stadium to watch the match. And you can see the Asian Cup final between Australia and South Korea live on ABC TV tomorrow night. It's on at 7.30 in New South Wales, Victoria, the ACT and Tasmania. Coverage starts at 7 o'clock in South Australia and 4.30 in Western Australia. The match can be seen on ABC2 in Queensland at 6.30 and in the Northern Territory at 6pm. You can also listen live on ABC Radio from 7.30 Eastern Daylight Time. Australian captain Michael Clarke is ahead of schedule in his recovery from a hamstring injury. He'll make his return to cricket this weekend with the Sydney grade side Western Suburbs. Meanwhile, the rest of the Australian squad is in Perth, preparing for Sunday's Tri-Series final at the Wacker Ground. Paceman Mitchell Johnson will play his first match since December's third test against India. I needed a fair bit of a rest. Um, you know, I think it probably... It'd been a big 12 months um, personally, um, but for all the bowlers as well. Um, you know, the UAE was, was was quite tough. We bowled a lot of overs over there, and, and then coming into Australia, the, the wickets were a little bit flatter than we expected. All rounder Shane Watson remains in doubt for the final because of a hamstring injury. Australian cyclist Cadell Evans will bid farewell to professional racing on Sunday when he competes in the race named after him, the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. After two decades in the saddle, which included a world championship and a Tour de France victory, he hopes this weekend's event will leave a lasting legacy on cycling and the local economy. After countless kilometres under his wheels, the end of the road looms for Australia's greatest ever cyclist. Evans. One final race to bring the curtain down on a spectacular career. Evans admits a few emotions have replaced his regular steely resolve. I'm a very experienced cyclist but I've never retired before and I've never done a last race before so I sort of don't know what to expect. The course along Victoria's spectacular coast was designed by, not for, Evans. But with world tour points up for grabs, he's not expecting an armchair ride into the sunset. Everyone's out, going to be out to get me on Sunday. <laughs> Whatever the result, businesses across the region are hoping they will be the big winners from the weekend, with thousands expected to see the events or even participate in the People's Ride tomorrow, where even the Prime Minister is a confirmed starter. In Evans' Australian home of Barwon Heads, locals are preparing for a Lycra invasion. To finish should be good. <laughs> Probably haven't done enough preparation. 
Um, oh, it should be a good day out. On coastal towns like Barwon Heads, we obviously need as many tourists as we can for as long as a period as we can. So events like this really add to the economic benefits of the town. Cadell fever is also sweeping Geelong. The hotels are full, the restaurants and bars are full. We are the capital of the world and as far as I'm concerned, this mayor is going to continue on his merry way, making us the biggest of the best. Melbourne must be thinking, oh my giddy up, I could be in trouble. Having climbed to the pinnacle himself, Evans can soon relax and enjoy the view. Cameron Best, ABC News, Geelong. The Super Bowl takes place this weekend, but as always, one of the fiercest battles won't be on the field. This year, companies spent up to a record $4.5 million for a 30-second ad during the Super Bowl. But they think it'll be worth it, with 110 million viewers expected to tune in. Some brands enlisted celebrities like Pierce Brosnan and Kim Kardashian, while other ads used a vision of the apocalypse to sell mobile phone cases. Here's a preview of what's in store. Each month, millions of gigs of unused data are taken back by wireless companies. Tragic. Data you paid for that could be used to see my makeup, my backhand, my outfits, my vacations, and my outfits. Sadly, all lost. Please, help save the data. Pierce, I'm so glad you're here because I got a role that is perfect for you, man. Don't tell me. Action adventure. Sort of. All right, picture this. We open on you. You're driving in a beautiful car up a snowy mountain road. You're going 200 miles an hour? No, 30. You look up in the trees and you see? Sniper. No, an owl. You come around a bend, there's something blocking your way. A missile launcher, right? No, a moose. A moose. Wait, well, what's the mission? Oh, there is no mission. Top secret, huh? Yeah. Absolute chaos. We've got blizzards in Africa. We've got tsunamis in Paris, and the whole thing's been tough. <laughs> We've still got some severe thunderstorms through parts of Western Australia. Now, the potential of damaging winds, large hail and heavy rainfall with these storms. It's mostly around central areas of the state, so the Gascoigne and um, also further south into the gold fields and the southern interior. It's the northern parts of the southern interior, though. The odd clap of thunder sitting to the west of Perth, but Perth itself really not expecting to see much in the way of rainfall or thunderstorms with this system. Now, the trough itself will be a feature as we move through the weekend, but the bulk of the activity is actually going to be moving a little bit further north than Perth. There's only about a 20 to 30 per cent chance of a thunderstorm over the next two-day period. Through the east, though, we've got this deep low-pressure system. Now, it will slowly start to weaken and move away from the southeastern corner. So tomorrow it's still going to bring some rain to Tasmania. In fact, uh, Hobart itself could see falls of 10 to 20 millimetres. And at this stage, forecast models are suggesting Hobart will actually be the wettest of the capitals across the country. The only other capital likely to see some rainfall is actually Darwin, but we're expecting to see fairly isolated showers and thunderstorms across that region. And with that cold southerly wind flow, temperatures still well below the average for this time of year across Tasmania and into parts of the south. East, but anywhere away from that coastal fringe, we are starting to see temperatures warming up again closer to the summer average. Now, through Western Australia, still the potential of some showers and thunderstorms. There is mention in the forecast of a possible thunderstorm for Perth itself. Very warm conditions continuing as well. Now, we've had seven days above 33 degrees. We've got seven days forecast above 34 degrees. But there's really only a very slight chance of these thunderstorms developing through the afternoon. Most of the other capitals should remain clear, dry and sunny. Similar story on Sunday. Very little variation in the forecast, although we could see a brief shower for Melbourne. Shower, rain will ease back to showers in Tasmania. And still most of the thunderstorms in Western Australia north of Perth, again, about a 20 to 30 percent chance that one or two might develop. Darwin also looking at the potential of a shower and thunderstorm. Melbourne should be mostly dry. Any showers will be very light and isolated.
And that is ABC News for now. I'm Rachel Papazzoni. The Drum with Julia Baird is next. Thanks for watching.